Hey everybody, welcome back to Salt and Light. Um, this episode is Ecclesiastes Part 9, so we're going to be looking at Chapter 9, and I've decided to name this Only One Opportunity. And the reason I decided to do that is because this chapter mainly goes into um, basically that. We just have one opportunity to seek God because we all have one life. After this life is over, the opportunity goes with it. Now, I apologize. I'm actually a little uh, stuffy, so you'll just have to bear with me. So if I sound a little funny, that's actually why. All right, so let's dive in here. We're going to start in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 1. It says, For I considered all this in my heart, so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. So I want to stop there and discuss what it means to be in God's hand. Now, right here where it says the righteous and the wise, this is talking about, remember, righteousness is merited only. Well, I wouldn't even say it was merited. Only the ones who have faith in Christ are considered righteous. So that's what it's talking about there. And then the wise would be those who have godly wisdom, those who have uh, sought out their Savior and found him. Then it says... Their works also are found in the hand of God. So, I went through and I found some scriptures that talk about God's hand. So, I'm going to read a couple of them and we're going to kind of discover what God's hand does for the person in it and the person who is out of it. So the first thing we know about God's hands is that he fashions with his hands. Now, what does he fashion? He fashions, uh, well, um, at the very beginning, he fashions creation. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 13 says, It was my hand that laid the foundations of the earth, my right hand that spread out the heavens above. When I call out the stars, they all appear in order. Okay, so he fashioned the world, made all things. That's the first thing. And just um, keep that in mind, that with his hands he forms, because that's going to help us understand what it means about their works being his hand in his hand as well. All right, so the next thing, The next thing we're going to read here is in Job chapter 12. Job actually talks about God's hand, and he says this, The tents of robbers prosper, and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand. But now ask the beasts of the field, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Right there, he's talking about his calamity. In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? So ultimately, this passage in Job says that God gives and he takes away with his hand including life, and that is regardless if you have been righteous or wicked. All right, and we'll touch on that a little bit more about how, uh, what, what um, part does your works play in your salvation? Uh, but before we get there, um, I also want to discuss... Uh, let's see. Right here in Ecclesiastes, in this very book, he also mentions uh, God's hand twice, but we're only going to look at one of these times. Uh, In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he said, Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy 
good in his labor, this also I saw was from the hand of God. So I just want to show you right here that he gives us our sustenance and the produce of our labor. And he gives us the labor itself. So that was a good verse to remember anytime you feel like um, anything you own is yours. Just remember, God has given you the ability to work. He's given you the job and he's given you what the job produces. So um, many good reasons to be thankful for all things right there. All right. And the last thing I want to look at is God's right hand. There's many verses in the Bible that talk about God's right hand. Now, there is, I think, a difference here. Oftentimes, when he's talking about his right hand, that's usually tied to his righteousness and justice. And ultimately, that is embodied in Jesus Christ. So, there's a couple of verses I want to read here, and this is going to help us understand what it means to be in God's hand and uh, as far as um, your security and protection and also your salvation and um, a couple more things that we'll look at. All right, so in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, it says, After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, that's talking about his disciples, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. So Christ is actually sitting at God's right hand. Now, if you're in Christ, so are you. Okay? So in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So how are we upheld by God? Well, it's through Christ. When you're in Christ, you're able to stand before God. All right, that's what that's talking about. All right, and then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, okay, so that's talking about your living in Christ, you're abiding in Him. Um, it says, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. All right, so we're looking unto our role model. We want to be like Christ. When you're in Christ, when you're living in this world, you seek to imitate Him. That is what it means to abide in Christ. However, Christ is the Word that was made flesh. Remember that. So how do we abide in Christ? Well, you saturate your mind with His Word. All right, so remember, when you're abiding in Christ, you're in His hand. So ultimately, when you saturate your mind with His Word, what is happening Okay, because your actions actually flow from your mind. The, uh, the impulse starts in the heart, and then it goes to your mind, the battleground of your mind, where you actually make the decision to do something physically. All right, so if you saturate your mind with God's Word and you're abiding in truth, um you will do the things God says you should do. Do you see how God's hand is at work there? And he's forming your works with his hand? Well, that's what that's talking about. Um, now, I just want to mention uh, the heart... Um, can have some fleshly impulses sometimes, all right? However, the impulse always has to go through the mind, okay? And that's where you fight the sinful impulses, all right? Now, since we have a changed heart, we also have the desire to do good, 
And when that comes into your mind, uh, goes through the checkpoint, um, it should definitely, if it's a godly impulse, be carried out, you know? And that's how that works. So the two main things, if you're found in God's hand, is salvation. And I have a little verse for that, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8. It says, but it is, it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, that's an Old Testament uh, passage, but it's talking about, uh, you know, he, he redeeming his people by his hand. So I just thought that was a fitting verse. Now, also, if you're if you're found in God's hand, remember, all Christians are in Christ. Okay, so if you're found in His hand, so is every other believer. So I wanted to point this out. There's going to be a unity of spirit there, and that also means a unity. Of well, it should mean a unity of mind. We all have the same salvation. We all have the same uh, word of God to go by. We're all of the same spirit. Now, in Second Chronicles chapter thirty, verse twelve, it says, "Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered." following the word of the Lord. Okay, so it's ultimately saying that all the sheep follow one shepherd. Okay, and uh, it's, it's the shepherd that's the head. So you see the unity of mind is basically coming from the shepherd. Okay. All right, so now we're going to move on. This is Ecclesiastes, back in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Okay, picking up where we left off. It says, People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. All right, right here, ultimately, this means that um, whenever we think about God's wrath, it seems unloving at the start. And as, as though he, he might hate us, and by this, I'm talking about the curse, because that's part of his wrath. That's a judgment against our sin, temporary judgment um, that, like I said, might seem hateful. But his intention is to bring us back to life. See, it's it's us who walked into death and he's try and he wants to lead us out uh, of where we got ourselves into Basically, he's trying to bring us back to life. So, um, I guess also this could mean that uh, everything that happens in life, everything that happens to man is really complex uh, for us to really know what's going on. All the people who surround us all have intentions and desires uh, that are hidden sometimes, and sometimes they're, you know, in the open. But we don't really know the intentions of those around us, you know. We can't see hearts. So we have a skewed understanding of their hearts and uh, even our own hearts. Also, in God's dealings with man, um, our perspectives are, are skewed. Man often accuses God of wrong, when really we're the ones who have done wrong. Uh, so we live in a world of confusion and chaos, and only when a man rests in God's sovereignty will he be at peace. All right. Um, now in Ezekiel, God actually discusses this exact thing, how we're our... Uh, perception of things is skewed. Now, in this passage, he's basically discussing how he's going to deal with sin. He says, whoever turns from wickedness, he will save. 
but whoever is righteous and turns from their righteousness, he will not save. And then this was their response. God said, Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? So he's asking them to examine what they're saying. And that's just man's tendency. We see love as hatred and hatred as love. Okay? So it's not a good thing to, to trust yourself. You trust um, our Creator, the, ones, the one who knows our hearts better than we do. All right, so moving on. This is uh, verse 2. That was, <laughs> We just got through verse 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 1. Now we're in verse 2. It says, all things come alike to all. Now, what does that word alike mean? It means not quite the same, but it's very similar. Okay, so it says all things come alike to all. This is basically saying everybody lives a life. Everybody has a mom and dad. Everybody uh, has similar problems and similar blessings. Everybody has the rain. Everybody has the breeze. Everybody will have some friends. Everybody will have family, food, pets, and trials and loss. So we all have good and we all have bad events in our life. You know, I'm not saying everybody's equal in those things. I'm just saying good and bad happen to everybody eventually. Now, as far as how much good and how much bad, that's kind of like in God's hands. All right, um, but then he goes on to say, but there's one event, uh, it says one event happens to the righteous and the wicked. All right, so this is, this one event is guaranteed to everybody. So he goes on to say, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as is the good so is the sinner. He who takes an oath as he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun that one thing happens to all. Now, what is he talking about here? What is this one thing? Well, up until this point, Ecclesiastes is preaching at you uh, about death, basically. And that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about that one event that happens to everybody, no matter what your action, what actions were in life, is death. So works don't matter as far as being delivered from humanity's ultimate punishment. All right. Then he goes on to say, Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. So ultimately, he, the underlying truth here, which uh, is all over the Bible, is basically saying none are righteous. Uh, if you need proof that you need a Savior, just look at what happens to everybody. Everybody dies. That's, that's what he's saying. Now when it says the heart of, uh, that, their, that madness is in their hearts while they live, and like I said, regardless of what they're doing, regardless if they look like they're per performing righteous acts and, uh, if, and if they're wicked, the proof is in the pudding. All right? Everybody ultimately has foolishness embedded within them. Just uh, go and read Proverbs that describes what a fool is. At some point in your life, you will fit that bill. You will have been a fool. All right. So that is something that we must be transformed out of, which only Christ's love can do. All right. So the, so talking about these circumstances and how um, bad events can happen to everybody, there was something interesting that Jesus said in Luke chapter 13. He was discussing... Um, some sad circumstances in, in which tragedy happened in Israel to uh, a group of people. 
This is in Luke chapter 13. So this is Jesus discussing tragedy. He says, There were present at that season some who told him about, excuse me, the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Jesus is saying these calamities that came on those men is eventually going to happen to everybody. So that's something to really think about. He's saying that all are under sin, all right, unless you repent. Now, real quick, I want to discuss what does it mean to repent. Repentance uh, isn't something that is physically done. You know, you think whenever you read that word righteous, you have, uh, you kind of have an assumption that somebody who's righteous uh, just performs good deeds. And that is half true. Because they do. Someone who is righteous will practice righteousness. However, what makes them righteous is repentance and faith. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is basically, I'll describe it as an attitude. It's a change of mind. You thought one way, then you were presented with the powerful, life-changing Word of God, and then you were... Uh, basically transformed into a man who desires to follow truth. It's basically accepting what the truth of reality is, which is given to us by God. And uh, the change of mind will humble you because a prideful man won't follow God's word. They'll think they have it figured out. But an humble man will realize um, what God is saying is right. All right, so is that doing anything? Just because you agree with God, should God save you for that? He doesn't have to. We could agree with God that we're wicked, and (laughs) what happens to wicked people? They deserve punishment. All right, so it's God's grace and mercy. Uh that we need, and he said he would give that to the one who seeks him in repentance. So I would say repentance is an attitude. A lot of people think repentance is stopping sin, Um, and it's not, because you can't stop sin. You're sinful. Now, should we uh, practice sin? No. Once you're repentant, you will not want to practice sin, or you shouldn't want to. Once you realize how destructive sin is and the truth behind what it does to you, uh, you shouldn't want to practice it. Okay, and that's part of actually believing God and what He says about it. Um, but basically, a repentant heart uh, still sins, but the difference is. How do you respond to sin? Because God tells you in his word how to respond to sin. If you sin, you run to him. You don't run away from him. All right? And another thing is confessing it. The Bible tells us to confess it. If you believe God's word with a repentant heart, when you sin, you run to him and confess it. Okay? That's And that's part of believing God's word. But that's what repentance is. It's just living a life that is uh, dedicated to truth, basically. And um, practicing it to the best of your ability. All right, so Ecclesiastes, we're going to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 just for a little 
review uh, verse 20 says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Okay? Yeah. So Ecclesiastes, right, right in chapter 7, says the exact same thing. All men sin. Difference is you view sin truthfully. All right. So moving back on to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now, before we get into this last part that we're going to cover, I want to read something Paul actually preached to the Greeks in Acts chapter 17. I thought this little portion of his sermon was would actually make a good transition into this next part of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, uh, it talks about uh, the hope that mankind has. Now, we know that uh, our hope is in Christ, but that's not the type of hope that he is, that Solomon is talking about. And right here in this little section in Paul's sermon, Paul actually uses the word hope in the same way Solomon does. So pay attention when we get to that part where he talks about the hope. It is in Christ, but also he's talking about it in a slightly different way. And I just want to point out the nuance. Acts 17, chapter 24. It says, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Okay, so... He's talking about the hand of God, what he gives. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. So the hope here is the opportunity to seek the Lord while he's there. Okay, that little verse in Hebrews that tells us to, uh, it says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's what he's talking about there. He's talking about that once a man starts to seek God, God knows immediately if, you, if you're seeking him because he's right there. He's ever-present. What's the word? Uh, omnipresence. That's one of his attributes. He's ever-present. Okay, we learn that in Job and other, many other places. All right, so continuing with what Paul said, he said, For in him we live and move and have our being. Okay, so right there, it's saying he's so present, in fact, he is your very life. He's the one sustaining your life, His the, the breaths that you take in, that is given to you by God himself. So, if you start to seek him, he will know it immediately. Alright, and then we go on, it says, as also some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So right there it's talking about man's hand. Man's hand doesn't shape God, doesn't shape his divine nature. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, which is talking about Christ. So my main point right there was to point out that this hope is slightly different. Now we're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 because Solomon will go on to explain what this hope is actually talking about. So, verse 4, 
It says, but for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Okay, so in context, this hope is referring to the ability all men have to seek God and find him. Remember Christ saying, all who seek me will find me. That's a promise from Christ our Savior. So another way to put this, when it talks about the living dog versus the dead lion, and it's better to be the living dog, a better way, well, I wouldn't say a better way, but a way I could put this to maybe make it more understandable is asking you this question. Would you rather be a CEO of a multi-million dollar company or a ditch digger? I'm trying to get you to pick CEO, but if you didn't, here's another question. Would you rather be the president or a drug di- or a, a drug user? Okay, I'm trying to get you to say president. If you said president or CEO, what if I worded it this way? Would you rather be a dead president or dead CEO versus a ditch digger or a drug user, a living one? Well, it's obvious. Life is precious. Life is more valuable than gold. Okay? And that's the point Solomon's getting at. Okay? He's saying all who are among the living have a hope. Okay? Now, he'll go on to tell us what he's talking about in the next couple verses. He says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing and they have no more reward. All right, so the living have an ability to know things. He says that they know they will die, so they they are aware of the coming judgment. So they have a chance still. They still have a hope. They can still seek God while God is near. And what does that mean, while God is near? Well, that means... While you're living, uh, he's near. All right. So once they die, they have no more reward, which means they have lost the opportunity. He goes on to say, For the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Now, where does salvation take place? Under the sun. So if they have no more part of anything under the sun, uh, the opportunity of salvation goes with it. All right, so quick summary up until this point, and then we'll conclude. Solomon's basically said so far that the righteous are secure in God's hands, and the works of the faithful, which are the Christ followers, whether good or bad, are taken care of. All men sin, all men die, the the poor, the rich, the righteous, the evil. However, if you, an evil sinner, are in God's hand, you live with the hope of life, and you can and you should conduct yourself like this and this will be our conclusion ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 7 he tells us to go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for god has already accepted your works let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil So that first part there, he says that you should go and eat your bread and drink your wine. And I think that's interesting because, uh, oh, and he says, do it with a merry heart. Because God has accepted you. So once you've found salvation, um, you can enjoy life. You know, you can enjoy the food God has given you because your soul has been satisfied. Once your soul is satisfied... You should be utterly content in in anything you're given or anything you do. So the portion that God gives you, the job, 
the what it produces should be enjoyed at that point because you're secure. But I think it's interesting that he uses bread and wine because that is actually, you know, parallels with the Lord's Supper. You know, it's very interesting. And then, uh, you know, God, you know, Jesus said he was the bread from heaven. And then that, you know, that the wine that the disciples uh, partook with him, he says, this is uh, my blood. You know, it's a representation of his blood. You know, then it says, for God has already accepted your works. Then he says, let your garments always be white. And I feel like this is talking about, you know, let yourself always be blameless. Walk in truth. Uh, walk with God. When you're going through this life, always consider him. Always pray to him. Have a relationship with him. Be blameless. And uh, that's only done in Christ. So it's very fitting that he pairs that with the bread and the wine. Then he says, and let your head lack no oil. Now, many times in the Bible, there is uh, something called anointing. Now, what is anointing? Well, we're going to look at a couple passages uh, the first one is in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 6. Oftentimes what they would do when Israel would um, pick a king or, you know, God pick, whenever God would pick their king, they would take oil and pour it on their forehead and let it run down their face, and they would call it anointing. So... Let me read this to you. This is an instance where they did this. It says, Then he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. All right. Now, King David wrote many of the Psalms, and we're going to read one that he wrote. And he talks about this oil, this uh, being anointed. But um, let's see. But in this psalm, we actually get the sense that this might be referring to something different, like a spiritual anointing. So let me read it. Verse 4 through verse 6. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. All right, this is talking. This is sounding like uh, a sheep and a shepherd. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Then he goes on to say, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Okay, he's talking about a table and a cup running over. You know, this this is pretty interesting because in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, he's saying that you should go eat your bread and drink your wine with a merry heart. And then, you know, he also says, let your head lack no, no oil. And his father, David, also says the same in this very same passage. So a table is prepared, his head is anointed, and his cup runs over. Then he says in verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this last little part lets us know that, you know, he's talking about salvation here. So it's very interesting. All right, so... What was my point there? Um, I'm saying salvation is related to this anointing of the head with oil. Because remember, we're heirs with Christ. Christ has been made king over all. And if we're found in Christ, we will also reign with him. Okay, but what needs to happen first? You know, 
what would God do to pick the kings of when he picked the kings of Israel, what did he do for them? He anointed their heads with oil. All right. Now I want to read Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And it, it says in this passage, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. All right, so we know before we were Christians, we had a burden placed on us. It was the burden of sin. And whenever you're saved, that is removed. But right here it says that the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing oil. Very interesting. And then I want to read one more uh, passage. This is actually in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. So it says in verse 8, But to the Son, he says, this is God, uh, the Father, speaking uh, to the Son. He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All right, so it says right here that Christ, having been the sinless, upright man that he was, that he performed righteousness, which we could not do. Okay, this is something no man could do. But God, his son, Jesus Christ, was able to perform it. And because of this, and because of the love that he showed on the cross for us, he was anointed as king over all. All right, that's what happened there. Now, one more passage I want to read to kind of tie all this together in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. This is how you can be found in the hand of God. It says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So basically he's saying if you're found in Christ you are anointed with him. So all the blessings that God has given to Christ also applies to us if you're found in Christ. So the anointing that was given to Christ is applied to you as well. Isn't that amazing? Isn't God amazing? Praise God. Absolutely. All right, so we'll end it there. The next lesson is going to cover the rest of chapter 9. I just don't want to get this too long because... Um, because the next section of chapter 9 is actually going, going to be kind of a long, drawn-out study, so I don't want to make this too long. So, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to, uh, hopefully you come back and finish. We're almost through the entire book of Ecclesiastes. It's been a really fun study, and uh, it's always good to dive into the Word of God. So, just an encouragement for you all. Please, please, read God's Word. If you don't read God's Word, you won't know truth. Okay, it, it doesn't just fly up into your head. It's not a magic thing. You have to, you have to read God's Word to get it uh, perme permeated into your mind. Okay, and that's the only way you're going to live how God wants you to, if you know Him and know His will. All right, so I hope you all have a great week. And God bless you all.